All right. Hello. It must be Wednesday, right? Because we're here. And I have mascara on, which only happens if we're doing an event. So I think that I should thank everyone who's here today to give me that um, opportunity. But I, I'm not going to admit to wearing pants with buttons. I, I'm not doing that yet. So um, above the waist, yes, I've got my mascara on. So for those of you who do not know, I am Ann Merchant, and I work for the National Academy of Sciences. And that's you. I'm Rick Lovard, and I am not wearing mascara. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we want to thank all of you for being here with us today. I do have a sleeping dog in, in the room with me. Um, and I think in this world of virtual events, um, there are some surprises that we can't control. We hope that technology is on our side today, but um, our canine friends are, are sometimes less controlled than um, our technology. Um, so the first thing that I want to do is, again, for those of you who do not know, um, a little bit about the National Academy of Sciences. I've said the last couple events um, that this is sort of the, the, I think what Abraham Lincoln had in mind when he created the National Academy of Sciences in 1863, um, to say that um, he needed uh, an institution that would be available to the nation to provide good science advice. And that's what we're doing today. We see our colleagues um, every day working round the clock to be able to be um, the, that advisor to the nation. Um, and we are very fortunate to play a small part in that by having the opportunity to do events like this. Um, I think with the benefit of hindsight, we'll see the way in which the academies has played a very large role in, in providing good advice to those who need it at a time like this. We're also very grateful to the Berman Institute for Bioethics. Um, the Academy's just released through its standing committee a um, what we're calling a, a rapid expert consultation on standards of care in crisis. And so when we thought about doing something on this very important, very um, conversation, we thought, well, there are no better people for us to turn to than our friends at the Berman Institute at Johns Hopkins. So we were very grateful that that they did, they were agreeable and um, and as busy as they are, that they came in to partner with us on this event. Um, the description for this event says that uh, that we are comparing um, the circumstances in which we find ourselves. That our hospitals are a bit like a war zone. I think where that comparison falls short in some ways is that. From war zones, we often have visual images so that the frontline reporting gives us a sense of where we are and what this looks like. Um, we're not always seeing that play out in that same way right now, that, that we're seeing instead um, reports from the, the Rose Garden, which it doesn't really always feel like a war zone, maybe it does. Um, but in the end, it's not the briefings that we'll remember. I think the New York Times referred to that today as the, the heartache in the hot zone. So I think that we're trying to bring a group of people together today that will talk a little bit about what that feels like and what that looks like. So I think that this will be a really good conversation for all of us. Um, I'm going to turn it to Rick to, to give you a sense of what the Science and Entertainment Exchange does regularly to connect the work that we do to the entertainment industry in Los Angeles and in New York. And, and so how we're playing that role today um, through the, the auspices of the exchange. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Anne. I'm Rick Lovert. I'm the program director of the Science and Entertainment Exchange, a program of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, so first, I just want to real quick thank the AV team, Amici and David, for all of the behind the scenes stuff that you're doing for to make this uh, run smoothly. And I also want to thank Courtney Sloan and Jeff Fishman and Sachi Gerben, who, uh, helped us set everything up to make today possible. And lastly, I want to thank uh, Cecil Castellucci for live tweeting the event, uh, the famed graphic novelist. I'm a big fan. Um, <clears throat> so I also want to finally thank anyone on this uh, event, in this event our audience, who took our survey from the previous two events. It really helped us out a lot in giving us some very useful feedback. There's going to be one that you'll get after this event as well. We, really, we go through uh, and read all that stuff. So please do keep uh, taking our survey. Um, so the Science and Entertainment Exchange is, uh, if you're a writer, producer, director, studio executive, you have a question about science as you're making a feature film, TV show, or video game, 
you call us at 844-NEED-SCI or you reach out to us through email and we will connect you with a STEM professional uh, for free, a volunteer STEM professional to answer your questions. Uh, we've done over 300 events and 3,000 consults, including films like Avengers Infinity War, Man of Steel, Black Panther, and Captain Marvel, to name a few. By the way, if you are a STEM professional and you're new to us and you're new to this event, please reach out. We are very interested. We're always looking for new volunteers in all sorts of areas. The questions we get are extremely broad from the entertainment industry. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank our sponsors, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, without whom this event would not be happening. So thank you, HHMI. Thank you to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, Walt Disney Company, Film Nation, Google, Lida Hill Foundation, Corteva, and individual donors like many of you who uh, chose the optional give uh, a donation uh, link for this event. Thank you, that makes a huge difference in helping us keep these going as well. Um, you're gonna hear from three experts today and Merchant is gonna tell you a little bit about each of those experts. At any time, uh, you know, before they speak, they'll each have about 10 minutes. At any time while they're speaking, there's a little Q&A toggle down here, down at the bottom of your screen. You can ask a question and I'm gonna be grabbing as many of them as I possibly can and curating the list and we're gonna get to as many as possible. We're gonna have about 20 minutes for Q&A at the backside of this event, hopefully. Um, so thank you very much and back to Anne. Thank you, Rick. Um, and we do know that uh, last time we, the last two times we've done events, we've had a lot of questions. So we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, but last time I think we had a hundred questions that we were saying that if we could get to a hundred questions, we'd set some kind of land speed record. We won't be able to do all that, but we'll get to a lot of them. Um, and um, as I said earlier, we're very grateful to um, our friends at the Berman Institute for Bioethics for partnering um, on this with us. We really couldn't think of a, a better team that would guide us through um, our sense of what the, the hot zone really feels like and looks like and what some of the decisions are that have to be made um, when our hospitals really do become that, that front line um, in a situation like this. So we're going, we has, as Rick said, we have three speakers, all of whom are associated with the Berman Institute, um, but they have different roles there. And so we're going to start with, you're going to tell, um, Yoram had actually asked, is it okay if I'm wearing scrubs? If I can wear pants with no buttons, he can certainly wear scrubs because he's a, a pediatric oncologist and I believe we're going to go to him um, in his uh, office at Sinai. So um, I'm going to turn it over to him and he will be our first speaker. And, uh, and that's, that's the transition. Thank you, Anne, um, and thanks to the rest of the crew at the exchange. And I just want to say hello to my uh, colleagues uh, and co-panelists, Cinda and Jeff. I appreciate you all uh, joining us uh, during these trying times. As you heard from Anne, I'm a pediatric hematologist oncologist, which means I care for kids with blood diseases and cancer. And I'm also a bioethicist. And while I do my share of bioethics research, my day-to-day -day bioethics work uh, is in the hospital where I help my fellow clinicians and patients as we grapple with uh, difficult decisions and different conflicting moral obligations. And ethics is part and parcel of what I do, uh, but it's really become front and center. Uh, and like so many of us uh, in ethics, this uh, COVID crisis is making me earn my keep. Uh, and we've all heard about the enormity uh, of uh, COVID and the challenges it's presenting for patients and clinicians. So my hope is that what I'll help you do uh, during uh, the time that I have is give you a picture of uh, what's happening at ground zero across uh, countless uh, hosp uh, hospitals across the country. Uh, and you all likely know that hospitals are faced with shortages uh, of basic and life-saving resources or they're at risk of facing these shortages. And uh, basic resources include things like masks and gowns and gloves and I'm fortunate that in my hospital we have enough uh, PPE, but we're also being mindful of the surge, and so I'm limited to one N95 mask for three days with a backup in case it gets soiled. And hospitals are seeing shortages of things like test kits and vents and beds and uh, saline solutions and blood products and medications and, of course, people. Uh, we know that uh, providers are getting sick, and it doesn't matter how many vents we have if we don't have the people who are trained to be able to use them. Uh, and, and these shortages, they're, uh, they're not hypothetical. They're happening with alarming frequency. And a case in point, a couple of weeks ago, I was at home enjoying a cup of coffee and I got an urgent call uh, from uh, the ICU about a, a woman uh, with COVID. 
and the providers were thinking about giving her a medication. And the wrinkle was on that particular day in our hospital, we only had one dose of that medication. Now, we like to say that ethics emergencies are rare. We have time to ask questions and reflect and clarify, but here we were faced with an urgent situation and we needed to make a quick decision. So how does one decide whether to give that last dose of medication? And related, who gets to make that call? And should we always give that dose of medication to the patient in front of us? Or maybe we should hold on to it in case there's a patient who's uh, more uh, deserving or a better candidate. And should the woman's chronic medical conditions be factored into decision making? And would you be more or less, less willing to give it to her if you knew that uh, she always refused her doctor's recommendation? And while you're thinking about those questions, I want you to think about a few more patients. The first patient is uh, a single mother of two and she has COVID. The second patient is a recent retiree who's a philanthropist and he has COVID. The third is a two-tour military veteran who's a medic and she also has COVID. And the last patient's a kid with cancer. And after rounds of chemotherapy, he's in remission, probably cured of his cancer, and he too has COVID. Now, each of these individuals is a real patient and very likely could be in a hospital in your town. And each of them needs a scarce resource, a vent, a bed, a medication. Now, in a matter of days, hospitals across the country have gone from having a single patient, like the patient I had, uh, in need of one scarce resource, to many patients in need of multiple resources. And I'm sure many of you have heard about the shortages of medications uh, that are, we're encountering across the country that are needed to safely place and keep patients on ventilators. And the problem is that those medications aren't just used for patients on vents, they're also used for treating patients' pain. And so in my world, that's kids with sickle cell anemia who have horrible painful crises, kids with cancer with horrible pain. So my colleagues and I right now are trying to figure out how are we gonna treat our patients' debilitating pain without the drugs we're used to doing that. My anesthesia colleagues are working furiously trying to figure out ways to use drugs that really are not meant to be used to place patients on vents. And ultimately, how do hospitals decide how to allocate a scarce life-saving resource among equally deserving patients. And who gets to decide? Should the bedside treating physician be that person or an independent panel? So let me tell you what happened at my hospital. When we started seeing what was happening with COVID, we got together and we realized we need some process. And I've been involved with allocating scarce drugs for kids with cancer. So I was a little bit familiar with this research and we put together a policy and my ethics committee reviewed it, revised it, and it was endorsed by leadership, and we felt pretty good about it. But at the same time, something remarkable happened. In an effort to come up with a uniform and consistent approach, hospitals from across the city and state came together. And in fact, Cinda and Jeff are part of this as well. And what you had suddenly was competing health systems joining forces and together developing a framework for ethical allocation of scarce life-saving resources. And a key feature of our framework that we have the benefit of being here in Maryland is that we actually have data from work that colleagues previously did that tells us how everyday Marylanders would want to allocate a scarce vent. And this is the answer to the first question I posed for you regarding who gets to decide. If we're going to ask doctors and nurses at the bedside how to allocate, we're always going to choose our patients. That's what we do. We're not going to be able to prioritize. So these decisions have to come from an independent panel of experts. And that panel should look like the communities we serve, these triage teams or scarce resource allocation teams, we call them. And in my hospital, that includes docs and nurses and pharmacists and respiratory therapists and social workers and clergy, ethics people. And importantly, it also includes community members. People who have skin in the game should have a say. Now let's get back to our patients. Let me remind you, we got a single mom of two. We have a a retiree and a philanthropist, we have a veteran who's a medic, and we have a kid with cancer, and they all have COVID, and all of them need that one vent. Imagine you've only got one vent. Who gets it? And in such a tragic situation, we need to make sure that our decision making and our process is reasoned and transparent and explicit and public, because that's the only way we're going to make sure that the communities that we serve have faith that we're not just making a willy-nilly decision, but that there's some thought behind it. And what this COVID pandemic is really forcing us to do is, it's forcing clinicians who are bound to prioritize the interests of their uh, patients to the interests of the greater community. And importantly, this doesn't mean that we stop caring. It means that we shift our focus from a personal ethics based on the patient and physician to an ethics of the larger community. 
as you can imagine, this isn't natural, and it's certainly not easy for doctors and nurses, but we can't be paralyzed. We've got to be ready. And so as much as possible, we minimize the effects of the COVID. And at the same time, we have a, a process that's based upon sound and justifiable ethical reasoning. And this is, means that as much as possible, we have to rely upon objective data. And that'll minimize emotion, minimize bias. And we actually have validated scoring systems that allow us to tell how likely is it that a patient's going to be able to leave the ICU and leave the hospital. But because the decisions we're making are so consequential, meaning you're going to live or you're going to die, we don't just rely on short-term survival. We look at long-term survival. What that does is it allows us to come up with a score and rank patients. But it's still not easy, even if we have a score. If I give the vent to the single mother of two, there's a good chance I've saved three lives. If I give it to the retiree who's a philanthropist, think how grateful he'll be. He may buy 20, 30, 100 vents that could save hundreds of patients the next time we have a pandemic. A real argument could be made that I give it to the woman who's a veteran and a medic. She's already sacrificed so much and she's a first responder. If she's healed, she could go off and save more people. Now, what about the kid with cancer? I mean, more than any of the others, he hasn't even had a fair shot at a, at a life. And doesn't he owe the opportunity, don't we owe him something like an opportunity to be able to live many more years? And who knows what he would go on and, and become? And so as you can appreciate, each one of our patients is deserving, but we only have one vent. And our decision ultimately is a decision that's going to affect three people in a very negative way. And these devil's choices, they're heart-wrenching for clinicians, and they cause us profound moral distress. And this is something that Cinda's got particular expertise on, and, and I think that she's going to talk about this to a degree. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, how do we break a tie? How do we decide when two or more patients have the same score? Well, there's some people out there that say that we should prioritize the youngest, uh, much like I talked to you about. And there's others uh, who say that we should give first responders priority. And there's reasons to do that, but there's also some detractors that say that we shouldn't. And I can tell you that the framework that, that our joint framework has adopted, we initially thought about adopting those, but we were a little bit concerned about public perception and things of that nature. And so we rely mainly on when we have patients in the same situation that we kind of draw straws. Now, an important feature of any good framework, including ours, is an appeals mechanism. If a patient, a family member, or a doc disagrees with the decision that that resource allocation team made, they can go to a secondary review that's comprised of independent people. So at my hospital, that's folks like the chief clinical and medical officer, the chief of nursing, the chair of ethics, and others. Now, my time is dwindling down here. So to wrap up, we owe it to the patients that we serve that A, they know about these shortages, more important, they need to understand that we have a process in place. And what I like about our process here in Maryland is it's not perfect, no system is, but it's consistent. No matter what hospital you show up to, likely you're gonna have a similar approach. And it includes data from what we know about patients themselves would want. Now these are horrible decisions and that doesn't, doesn't ignore that, but at least it gives us a little bit of a comfort that we're gonna have a consistent approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yoram. And, and our apologies to the audience. We're having a little bit of trouble with the with some technical stuff behind the scenes, but you know, it's better than a dog barking, perhaps. Um, but we we really appreciate that. And I do think that these are just very tough questions. And I think as you said, Cinda is going to give us a sense of um, of some of the, the, the perspective that, that keys off of what you were talking about. Um, Cinda is a, um, a professor of clinical ethics at the Berman Institute for Bioethics and also at the School of Nursing at Johns Hopkins. Um, so I'm going to transition over to Cinda and try not to jump in with my timer. But if you see my timer, you'll know that we're trying to just keep things on time for our speakers. Thank you, Anne, and, and uh, thank the academies for putting us together. I'm a nurse, and so um, I'm going to try to make this a little bit more personal. Um, I'd like to uh, invite you to imagine yourself as a critical care nurse, an experienced one, maybe 12 years of experience. You're working in a really busy ICU in a city where the number of COVID patients is increasing moment by moment. You've worked four days in a row, and by the end of the day, uh, 14 hours by the time you finished your documentation. Your diet has mostly been coffee and, if you're lucky, a protein bar, and you're about to leave for the day. 
you ceremoniously take off your scrubs, you put your shoes in a plastic bag, you put it in the back seat of your car, and you start driving home. And the day uh, that you've experienced begins to be reviewed, and you start thinking about all the things you forgot to do. The time that you didn't have to spend with your patient, the um, meds that were late, the things that were left undone, and you feel a certain heaviness about, did I do any good today? And you wonder, is my PPE working? Am I safe? Am I going to get sick? Am I going to make others sick? And then you arrive home and your new ritual is that you go immediately into the shower and you find yourself in the shower trying to wash off the residue of the day. And in that, as the soap and the water is going across your body, tears start flowing. As you remember the faces of the people you took care of, the ones who did better and the one who died all by themselves. And so now you have to re-enter your family. You've hardly seen them, your husband, your two children. And now you're at the dinner table and you didn't have any energy to do anything but another pizza or a frozen dinner because you're so exhausted. Your kids want attention and you wanna be close and you're worried about how am I ever gonna do this without infecting them. You finish all your chores at home and you throw yourself into bed hoping for a good night's sleep, but the reality is you toss and you turn and at 5 a.m. the alarm goes off again and you start again. You put your clothes on, you get in the car, you grab a cup of coffee and you wonder what's today gonna be like. So you arrive and what you find is that overnight uh, the hospital has had an influx of COVID positive patients. There are short supplies of everything, mostly ventilators, and you're now in your triage plan. You go to the unit and you receive your assignment. Usually you have two patients, but now you have three. Two of them are stable, uh, for the moment at least, and then you've gotten a new admission. And by the end of the shift, you'll probably have four. Your new patient is a woman who's 51. She's a teacher. She has children the same age as yours. And she is having a lot of breathing problems. She's very unstable. And the triage officers just told you that there's no more ventilators and she will be managed in the intensive care unit. As you put on your garb, your gown, your gloves, your face mask, your shield, you go into the room to greet her and you see this anxiety on her face. As you begin your head to toe assessment, you notice the tinge of blue around her mouth that tells you she's not getting enough oxygen. She's breathing really hard, each inhale and exhale is heaving, very distressing. And you think, well, under other circumstances, I would be asking her, what does she want now? But I can't because there are limited resources and the options are pretty limited. I might be talking to her family, but they're not there either because families aren't allowed to visit because we're worried about the spread of the disease. So I feel this angst about what am I going to do now? I start to leave and her eyes meet mine and she whispers, please help me. And my first response is, I wanna walk away. But instead, I summon my courage and I say to her, you know, everything's gonna be all right. And in my heart, I know that that's absolutely not correct because this is the fifth patient I've had this week that's had this very same experience. So I leave the room, I take off my garb and my eyes meet the other nurses who have the same pained look on their face. We all feel like we just abandoned our patient. And I can't even ask for help because I know that everybody that I'm working with is drowning just like I am. So in the middle of this physical, emotional and psychological uh, exhaustion, what I'm experiencing is moral distress as your, your Ram mentioned. 
moral distress is the gap between what we think we ought to be doing and what we're actually doing. And in that gap is a, a place of great distress. Moral distress is not new in healthcare. It's uh, part of what we do, but what is new is the accumulation of the moral residue that goes along with these decisions. This moral residue really comes from the unmet obligations that we have that persist even when you do the right thing in a very constrained environment. It often provokes feelings of guilt, of shame, regret, and often a sense of moral failing. We know that it accumulates over time and that it can become a very heavy weight that contributes to burnout, which is a syndrome of uh, emotional exhaustion, cynicism, and uh, a sense of uh, lack of personal accomplishment. These are really extraordinary um, circumstances. And what we see often, and in the work that I do, is people respond in a whole variety of ways. Some people become despairing and feel helpless and powerless. Others become numb and sort of go through the motions and shut down, overwhelmed with the emotional and moral burden that they experience. And others become angry and morally outraged, which is not an unexpected or unjustified response when our values have been challenged in this very profound way. It can lead some to become so exhausted that they decide to leave their profession um, and as you all know, we have critical shortages. I just saw a very concerning statistics that two thirds of nurses are considering leaving their jobs or the profession as a result of this pandemic, which is very concerning to me. On the other hand, there are also people who are able to harness their inner resources and their integrity and to leverage their competence, their skills, their knowledge and compassion to focus on what is in front of them with the resources that they have. Um, you know, as a nurse, uh, we're often the last thread of compassion for patients. And um, in these situations, uh, it calls us to really connect to why we're here and to remember the important work that we do. You might think that these are really heroic acts, but for many uh, nurses and other clinicians, these acts uh, really come from a deep well of uh, commitment, of competence, of awareness of our ability to actually see the possibility of easing suffering even when we cannot prevent death. So this pandemic has really called us to consider how to provide the greatest resources to those most likely to benefit. And it does not erase our ethical obligation to care for the one right in front of us with as much skill and compassion as possible. Make no mistake about it. This is hard work. It's not a theoretical exercise. It's real life. And I think often what you see is there are no easy or universal answers and the toll is really significant. You hear a lot of clinicians say, and I've said it myself, this is just what we do. But in a pandemic, this is not just what any of us does. This is not business as usual. Um, it's challenged the core of what it means to be a nurse, a doctor, any clinician. And now I think our job is to focus on how do we heal these wounds of PTSD, of um, depression, of anxiety, of burnout in our clinicians uh, once this pandemic is over. Thank you. So maybe I shouldn't have worn mascara today. <laughs> um, so thank you, Cinda. Um, I should also say that, you know, we've done events with the Berman Institute before. Um, and we've always really enjoyed those conversations, but they've always been um, hypothetical. I mean, I guess they've been hypothetical, but based on data. Um, and this is the first time we've had these conversations uh, where they've been so real and so present. And as I said, when we opened that, you know, we, we don't have a lot of the photographs and, and the things that make this so real, but obviously 
um, when Cinda talks about this, these are the real situations. And though we see some encouraging news out of places like New York, um, this, this continues. Um, and so we're turning last to Jeff, who is the director of the Berman Institute, um, because we thought that, you know, he's not a physician um, or a nurse, uh, but he brings a very valuable perspective um, to the ethics of this situation. So I'm going to hand it over to Jeff um, and let him give us the last 10 minutes. Thanks, Anne. <clears throat> and thanks, Yoram and, and Cinda. Um, it, it makes me remember why I, uh, I'm proud to call you my friends and colleagues. So these are, are tough um, issues, as you've heard um, from, from both um, Cinda and, and Yoram. And I'm not a clinician, as you heard Anne say, um, but it, these are uh, real issues that we're facing in a real way, as Anne also said. And among the things that I have um, been asked to do, and Cinda is uh, on the same committee with me, is help to craft the framework that we're using at Johns Hopkins and that our partners, including Yoram at Sinai, are signing on to for framing um, how to allocate in conditions of um, scarcity. So the first thing I want to say is uh, we, we hope we uh, never face the situation where there are more patients than there are life-saving resources available. Um, uh, that's what we're talking about as, a, um, as on the horizon. You know, there's some talk about whether that is likely to happen um, yet in New York. It, it feels like it may um, not need to happen, um, but they have a lot of resources there in addition to a lot of people, and there's still worry that across other parts of our country and certainly around the, the world that there will be um, crisis situations where triage is what's required, deciding who among the, the patients who need life-saving resources should get them. So I, I want to talk about that in a um, in a stepwise way and, and lead uh, you all to think about this through uh, answering a series of, of questions. So the first is what we would need to allocate, and I'll, I'll come back to these, so I'm not going to answer them yet. The second is how to think about the ethical principles or, and framework from those principles that should apply to how to answer the question about um, allocating those things. Um, what characteristics uh, of the people who need them matter in answering the question about allocation. And then crafting criteria to do that allocation, and being specific about what those are, and you heard a little bit from Yoram um, about, about that. Uh, when to do so, what's the trigger um, to invoke that process, and then who to do it who to do that deciding about triage. So let me take those each in turn and it will take me longer to work through the, the answer to the first and the other. So bear with me. So you I'm sure have read or, or heard in the various um, media outlets about concerns that there would not be enough ventilators for patients who um, end up in the hospital uh, in respiratory distress. You heard in very, um, um, personal term from Cinda about what patients look like when they aren't able to get enough oxygen. And there has been concern that COVID um, affected patients would need to be uh, on ventilators, some significant proportion of them. But there aren't that many ventilators available in hospitals or around the country. So one issue is how we would allocate ventilators if there were not enough. But that's not the only thing. And in fact, probably not the first thing. Uh, ICU beds are also so in uh, short supply, because we don't need huge uh, extra supply of them under normal circumstances. And so among the things that people who work on pandemic preparedness have said for a long time is we need to prepare, we need to prepare, we need to make sure we have surge capacity. Um, we didn't do a good job of that, which is why we're having these conversations at all. So ICU beds, um, ventilators, I saw in the Q&A, um, box as um, Yoram and Cinda were talking some questions which included ECMO. What about ECMO? ECMO is a machine that um, not only breathes for the patient but also circulates their blood. Uh, there are fewer of those than there are ventilators and so for sure there will be shortage of those as well. Cinda made clear that that staffing uh, the, the heroic healthcare workers who will need to care for people in IC, ICUs and, and manage the, their ventilators um, will be in short supply, not only because we don't have 
lots of them um, to spare already, but because some of them will become sick and won't be able to um, come to work and may in fact need um, significant health care themselves. It also turns out that there are shortages or likely to be shortages of things that are not for COVID patients per se, but that are affected by the pandemic outbreak, including blood. The blood supply is being um, suppressed because people are being told to stay at home. And the blood supply depends on altruistic donors to make sure that we have enough. It's a perishable resource. It always needs to be replenished. And everybody who needed blood before will likely continue to need blood. Yoram mentioned sickle cell um, disease patients, and, and those individuals still need blood transfusions. Some things have been pushed off as elective surgeries, but there are certain kinds of um, conditions that just can't wait for transfusions. Um, unlike ventilators or ICU beds, which are allocated one to one, one patient to one bed, blood is different. Um, blood is used in, in uh, variable levels. Some patients require very little to be um, treated and they're done using, and, uh, and other patients need huge amounts of blood, sometimes hundreds of units uh, for things like gunshot wounds or liver transplants that don't go well or postpartum hemorrhage after a woman gives childbirth. And so it's a little bit like, or actually it's a lot like the trolley problem that you may have read about or heard about in your um, Ethics 101 in college, or if you're a fan of The Good Place, it's a prominent storyline in season two, I believe, um, where a decision has to be made about whether to turn the trolley down the track to um, kill one person in order to save two on the other track, the blood issue is a sort of version of the trolley problem where one person could use literally four or 500 units of blood, which could otherwise be used for sometimes hundreds of patients. So do you save one and allow hundreds to die, or do you allow one to die to save hundreds? So those are the kinds of ethical issues that are um, likely to be faced in conditions of real shortage. So how do we do that from an ethics perspective? And I'll be faster for the rest of my remarks. So. States like Maryland, and this is going on all over the country, have um, convened committees like the one I mentioned Cindy and I were part of, and Yoram um, led the effort at his hospital, uh, tried to answer the question, what are the ethical principles and, and framework to be um, guiding the questions that I've um, just touched on? So there's clear duty to provide care. You heard both Yoram and Cinda talk about that from a very personal perspective. But there's also a duty to steward resources, especially when they're scarce. We want to steward them in a way that distributes them fairly using um, procedural justice and equitable standardized approaches. And we want to be transparent in the way we do that. So all of those matter, but it also matters that we want to maximize the benefit, save the most lives, enhance survival for the most people, kind of very utilitarian approach. And so crafting frameworks that allow us to serve those ethical principles um, while making sure that we um, honor the values of saving the most lives is the challenge at hand. Yoram mentioned that there's an argument about saving younger lives because they have more lives ahead. It turns out that that runs into problems with federal anti-discrimination law. And so when we talk about hypothetical versus real life, um, there have been lots of efforts and projects talking about how the public might think when faced with dilemmas like this, whether it was worth saving older or younger people. And the majority would say, well, save younger people first. That makes sense. Well, that runs up against federal anti-discrimination law as we try to implement that as a matter of policy. And so we've crafted in Maryland and around uh, the rest of the country policies that try to square the circle, as it were, and make sure that we um, satisfy these concerns about um, stewarding resources, caring for patients, trying to maximize the most number of people that can be saved, but also not discriminating against those who are old or disabled or come from a background that somehow um, may be underserved. And so um, we're, we're facing um, really challenging questions, doing our best to craft policies that will allow us to um, satisfy these ethical principles in ways that also don't run afoul of federal um, and state law. The last thing I wanna say is people like Yoram and Cinda who are the true heroes in these stories, the frontline healthcare workers need to be protected because if these triage decisions need to be invoked, they could be charged with um, doing less than the standard of care demands. And that's uh, both a legal and a professional liability. 
And so states like Maryland and New York and Pennsylvania and Michigan and wherever you may be um, are thinking about their governors issuing executive orders that will not only make clear the processes that hospitals in their states will follow for these very difficult triage decisions, but making sure that the professionals and the hospitals where they work will be protected from liability um, if they have to um, invoke these really challenging decisions. Um, with that, I'll stop. I see my time is running out, and I know there'll be lots of questions that you all have for us. So thanks, Anne and Rick, for convening us today. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, so the, the first question that we got from the audience that I think was most asked was just, if you're just a member of the general public, uh, what can you do to help? I need to unmute to answer that. So maybe I'll start and, and others can join. So one thing that, you know, you heard me talk about blood and I spent more time on that than the others because it's gotten less attention and it's a different kind of ethics problem, but there's a, a sort of easy way to address that shortage, which is to give blood. And there, there is no reason not to give blood. In fact, the American Red Cross has started to run public service announcements saying it's safe. We have set up ways to make sure there's social distancing and we'll do it in ways that uh, make it easy for you. So that's that's one answer and that's a really important thing for people to be able to do. Um, one other thing I'll say, um, because we talked about it a little bit before we came on, is that tomorrow, April 16th, is National Advanced Directive for Health Care Decisions Day. Um, and it's it's the day after tax day because only two things are required of us, death and, death and taxes. And so National Health Decisions Day is meant to rem remind us that we have um, not only the opportunity, but the responsibility to let our loved ones know what we want in terms of our healthcare decisions. And so one thing we can do is say how much aggressive treatment we want if we were to find ourselves needing these very high-tech, um, invasive, aggressive healthcare. And if you don't want it, that's really important to know so that it isn't something that is um, done to you rather than something you would prefer to have done for you. So with that, I'll stop, and I'm, I'm sure Sind and Yoram have other things to add. I, can... well, I think there's some really simple things that people can do. I think you've probably seen the request for um, cloth masks of you know any stripe. Uh, now they're being required in most healthcare organizations, and uh, mm -hmm. there's shortages of those. Uh, they're not sufficient for taking care of an infected patient, but I think that is a, a way that people can help I think um, also I would suggest um, reaching out to the people who you know are healthcare professionals and offering um, support. Uh, I think there's a, a real tendency in the middle of this to feel isolated. We all feel somewhat isolated, but it's hard when you're a clinician dealing with these really difficult things to not sort of withdraw yourself and sometimes um, you know, that makes us feel even more alone. So reach out and offer some uh, good support uh, to the healthcare professionals that you know. And I, I would, what I would add is uh, listen to what we've been told repeatedly. Wash your hands and stay home. I cannot emphasize that enough. Our colleagues, especially on the adult side, are drowning. They're being overwhelmed by patients. And um, I took a uh, a bike ride this weekend in my neighborhood, keeping distance from people, and there were folks in large groups um, having a good time. And I understand that, but uh, just if we get out there too soon, and this is not ethics, this is public health, uh, but it does, it says our collective responsibility for one another. If we break these restrictions too soon, we are in for a world of hurt. Okay, I've had three versions basically of what is more or less the chain of command between hospital administrators, nurses, and physicians in terms of how care is administered. You guys should take that on. Cindy, you can start. <laughs> well, so um, that's an interesting question. In our, in our um, triage framework, uh, what we have is uh, an organization that has declared a state of crisis uh, in a state, hopefully, where their governor has put in the appropriate um, protections. 
Um, but we have a triage team and uh, the way we're designing it at Hopkins is that team rather than one individual includes a physician, a nurse, and uh, another healthcare professional with the advice of an ethicist. So what we're trying to do is to create, uh, as you can imagine, if you were the one person having to make those individual decisions, it's a very heavy weight. And so um, we've created uh, triage teams for that purpose to spread the responsibility to a team and also to uh, decouple the decision-making of the clinician who's actually taking care of the patient from the people who are making the decision about what will be allocated. What we heard very clearly from our, pa from our colleagues is they already have a relationship with this patient and they don't wanna be the one to come and say, I'm so sorry, you don't get the blood, the ventilator, whatever it is. And so it's another way to, to actually provide some support for our frontline colleagues who have to then implement the decision. And that's uh, often the place where, um, you know, as a nurse, uh, we're always in the middle. Uh, we are implementing the decisions of others most of the time. And that's a, it's an, a, it's a different place to be in rather than having the uh, absolute authority, although nurse practitioners have similar authority. But in general, um, that's a place where we're implementing the decisions of others. And so we need to have a team that shares in that decision making. Um, okay, what are some of the support mechanisms that actually are available for medical professionals right now? And do you have any tips for medical professionals who are trying to reach those resources? I'm gonna brag on, on Cinda and let her talk, but let me, <laughs> let me do that first. So um, Cinda is a, a world expert in moral resilience, in particular for healthcare professionals. And early on in the, um, as we were planning, for the, the pandemic, um, it became clear that people were getting experiencing much more stress even than they otherwise would be. And so she set up um, moral resilience rounds and I'll let her talk about what that means, but I think it has been a really successful way to try to offer some of the services that I think the question is invoking. So, Cinda. Thanks, Jeff. Um, uh, what we've done is um, we recognize that there were a lot of moral distress, people were really struggling. And, you know, here we are, we can't actually join together as we normally would. And so we created a virtual platform using Zoom um, weekly, where we have uh, uh, an hour that is dedicated for really creating a space where we can come together and to share the, the challenges. We've, we've actually uh, partnered with our colleagues in Peabody. We have a musical interlude to begin. We do a, a beginning gathering practice and then open it up to see where people are. And uh, I think it has uh, served a, a number of our colleagues um, and it creates an acknowledgement of the weight that people are carrying. I think there are lots of other things. Um, and, you know, uh, I was uh, very privileged to be a part of the National Academies Committee that focused on the issue of burnout and systemic approaches. And I think that um, this is a time when, first of all, it reveals, uh, again, some of the fissures in our systems in terms of providing support for clinicians, but it also provides an opportunity for us to actually intensify and deepen the kinds of resources that um, are offered. So we have a, a program called uh, RISE, Resilience and Stressful Events, which is peer-to-peer -peer support and more mental health services and making them more readily available, regular mindfulness practices, and um, access to um, people who can actually um, coach and guide frontlines clinicians who are struggling with a whole variety of um, responses uh, emotionally and morally. So uh, can you describe a bit the equity sort of an inequity of care based on the size of the hospital to which a patient might have access and that hospital's access to life-saving equipment and PPE. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to run with that one, Rick, and I'm sure that Jeff and Cinda can also chime in. Um, you know, this is one of the great problems in our health system. There are 
even where there are hospitals, there are hospitals that have deeper pockets than others. And if you're fortunate enough to live in an area that you have good care, uh, there is a reasonable chance that you, you'll be able to, to do reasonably well. But if you, if you live in an area that doesn't have the resources that some of the bigger hospital systems do, that's inherently uh, unequal. And, and so what a lot of hospital systems, and one of the things I think that I'm proud about by this joint approach that we're doing here in Maryland with Hopkins and University of Maryland Medical System and MedStar and LifeBridge and Luminous Health and others is that we've all agreed that we are going to play nicely in the sandbox. And so if I have a patient in my hospital that is in need of something and I don't have that resource, I can call a friend literally down the street at another one of the hospitals and can you help? And we have an agreement that we will help. And now hospitals typically do this uh, in general, but it's really important in the time of scarcity that there is a, an acceptability and a willingness and a statement that we're going to do that. And so that doesn't, that doesn't solve the questioner's excellent uh, uh, point, but at least it, it tries to level the playing field a little bit. You know, I, I would say, I think that's all exactly right. And it's, it's put into stark relief by um, uh, something I experienced today. I was on a, a Zoom call with a colleague in the UK and I was talking about what we were you know, trying to manage. And he said to me, I don't understand why you have such a problem moving things around. The National Health Service just moves the things that they need wherever they need them. And of course, that's not the way our health system works. And so it's just you know, a reminder um, that there are very particular aspects to the way we deliver healthcare in the United States, which are unique to us, not in a good way, um, which are part of the story here. Now, uh, if, you're, if you're a decision maker trying to keep an essential workforce safe right now, whatever that workforce may be, what are some tips that you would offer for, for those folks? I can jump in there too, and then I'm happy to, to let the others chime in. Uh, so we realized pretty early on because clinicians, nurses, docs, we, we all work together in the hospital. And if one of us gets sick, we've just taken down the entire division and potentially beyond, and that doesn't do our patients any good. So we have developed a uh, process in place where we are working on a skeleton crew. Skeleton crew that's sufficient with backup, but when I'm either not on service, this week I'm on service, I'm in the hospital, so I'm here every day, but typically there would be many other members of my division here. We just have one other doc or nurse practitioner who's seeing patients in the clinic. And that way, if one of us gets sick, we've got the other people around. And, and I think a lot of hospitals are doing a similar type of mechanism. And it's making sure that we're staying, as Cinda said, both healthy uh, physically and mentally so that we can come and do our, our day to day. So I would just add, um, you know, I think uh, we are in territory where people want to be reassured that um, the protections that are needed to keep them safe are available. And the PPE question is one that comes up every single time we get together about, is this sufficient? And part of that is because uh, the information has been changing, the standards have been changing, it's very confusing about what level of, of protection is needed in different circumstances. So I think one thing is uh, in terms of communication, uh, to communicate often, to communicate transparently, and to listen to people's concerns, because the worst thing in, in the midst of this pandemic is for people to feel that their concerns are not taken seriously. And so being able to put in place forums like town halls and other things where people can bring their concerns and uh, to have them heard and taken seriously um, so that there's action and responsiveness to those concerns. Um, and I think that goes a long way to what Yoram is talking about. And one of the things I have really been amazed by is the amount of collaboration and uh, collegial relationships that have just, you know, shined through in the midst of this um, have just been stunning to watch. Uh, the silos that have been dissolved and the way in which people are coming together is just really heartening. Yeah, there, there, it's an interesting question. And, and there's been lots of talk about physicians, 
predominantly physicians who are being asked to um, perform tasks that are outside of their typical roles and maybe outside of their comfort zone and whether they should be required to do that or whether they should even be allowed to do that. On the other hand, there are amazing stories of you know, medical students asking to graduate early because they can't do their clinical rotations anyway and they wanna go and do whatever they can on the front lines. We have colleagues at, at, um, at Hopkins who are finishing up uh, residencies in particular areas. Radiation oncology is one that I know about where they've said, we can't do that. You know, we're not licensed yet and there isn't much of a need let us learn how to be ICU nurses so we can go do that work. So really, really heartening stories about how to make sure we do keep up the essential medical workforce. I see Rick, you wanna end, it looks like. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm so, I think we are out of time. One question I think is really, really relevant, maybe just very, very quickly. Do you guys think we're past the worst of it yet? Where? And that's, <laughs> that's not meant to be a, a rhetorical question. So it's not, there's, you know, this is not one outbreak. It's an outbreaks all over the place, and they're happening at various paces and very to varying degrees. That's that's my answer. My answer is this is the first time I've worn scrubs to work since I was in medical school. So no. Yeah, I, I'm not sure we've seen the end of it. I I suspect that we may see a resurgence once we loosen up our um, social distancing and hopefully it will not uh, collapse our healthcare system, but I don't think it's over yet. Well, thank you all for uh, these incredible talks. Um, now it's my, my role to turn it over to Anne for the very close, but thank you for taking the time today. Yes, and, and I can only join Rick in thanking all three of you um, and the Berman Institute for that. As I said at the top of it, this feels like a really important conversation. And because as all three of our speakers said, we're, we're not at the end of this, um, it felt like a timely one as well. Um, our programming for the last three weeks has, has been COVID related. We're, we're not done with that. We have some additional programming already in the works. Um, we've got uh, our friends from Esri. They're a geospatial mapping company, probably the, the biggest one in the world. Um, we've got that scheduled for April 29th. Uh, Jack Dangermond, who is the founder and CEO of Esri will be joining us for that. We're very privileged to have him come in and talk about, I think a lot of us are sort of obsessed with that uh, Johns Hopkins map and we're, we call it the Johns Hopkins map, but um, Esri is um, a big contributor to that map. Um, and we'll put a, a link up so for those of you who haven't looked at that map, we can, we can give you a link to that so that you can become newly obsessed with it um, before the event. Um, and, and so uh, Jack will talk to us about, and he'll be joined by his chief medical officer, uh, will talk to us about the ways that maps reveal things about things uh, like a global pandemic that would be otherwise invisible to us. Um, we're going to be, though, trying to punctuate our COVID conversations with other more general science conversations, because as Rick talked about, we've been um, surveying you and asking you questions, and we do listen. Um, and so you've said to us, yeah, we want to keep up with current events, but it shouldn't be all COVID all the time. Um, so we've got some other things coming up. Um, in particular, Kirk Johnson, who is the director of the National Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian Institution will be joining us. Um, and we also have Kevin Han, um, who has a new book out called Alien Oceans. He's with JPL um, and he studies Europa, but he also studies the deep ocean to understand more about um, distant planets. And so he'll be joining us. We have to line up a date. We're gonna to talk to him about when he's available. Um, and so we've got a lot coming and we want to keep this virtual programming going. So we very much appreciate the fact that you've been here with us um, and we're going to continue to be here for you. Um, so as part of the survey that Rick will send out to you, if you've got things that you would like to hear about, other topics, um, don't feel shy about using that box where we say anything else you want to tell us, feel free to use that. And I think the survey now, how many questions is it? I think we got it down to what? Three questions, you guys. It's three questions. Please fill it out. Thank you. We really appreciate it. So easy, so easy. And so we apologize for the for, for my phone being up there with the with the timer. We know that that was um, a little bit of a distraction, but it just shows you that we were trying to keep things on time. So um, we'll do better with that next time. We're still learning. We're all still learning. Zoom land is a new land for us. 
So we hope to see you again. Oh, and next week, uh, April 22nd, our friends at the cultural programs of the National Academy of Sciences, they're running an event. So it's going to be a bye week for the Science and Entertainment Exchange. So we're going to send you their invitation. They do amazing programming. They're um, a, a sister program at the, at the National Academy of Sciences. So tune in for them um, just the way their audiences have been tuning in for us. So we'll send that invitation to you. Okay, so it's time for us to go. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And thanks again to the Berman um, panelists. They were amazing. Okay, bye.